Welcome to episode 71 of the Energy Balance Podcast, where we teach you how to live without constant hunger and cravings, fatigue, brain fog, poor sleep, and other low energy symptoms by maximizing your cellular energy. I'm Jay Feldman. I'm a health coach and independent health researcher. And joining me again today is my good friend, Mike Fave. Mike and I have been studying health and nutrition together for a long time now. And Mike also draws on his experiences from working within the healthcare industry. Today's episode is a Q&A episode where we'll be discussing how much weight gain can be attributed to increases in glycogen storage when adding in carbohydrates to your diet. We'll be talking about at what point weight gain would be a sign of an underlying metabolic issue. And we'll also be discussing the best ways to get calcium if you're not eating dairy, potential ways to improve your tolerance to dairy, the best form of calcium to use as a calcium supplement, and which calcium-containing vegetables might be worth including in your diet. If you have any questions that you'd like us to answer on a future Q&A episode, you can send those in to j at jfeldmanwellness.com. That's j-a-y at jayfeldmanwellness.com, or leave those in the comments if you're watching on YouTube. To check out the show notes for today's episode, head over to jfeldmanwellness.com slash podcast you can take a look at the studies and articles and anything else that we discuss throughout today's episode. And I do have an announcement to make again in case you missed it, which is that Mike's new website is live. You can find it at mikefavenp.com. That's mikefavenp.com. And over at his website, you can take a look at the content he's creating and he's also offering consulting. So you can contact him there if you're interested. And as always, you can take a look at my website at jfeldmanwellness.com, where you can take a look at my articles and the podcast and other content as well as my services. And if you are dealing with any low energy symptoms, maybe those are symptoms that we'll be discussing today as far as weight gain goes when adding in carbohydrates to your diet or any digestive symptoms, especially in regard to dairy, or if you're dealing with any other low energy symptoms like chronic pain or fatigue or brain fog, or poor sleep, or hormonal imbalances, or if you're dealing with any chronic health conditions, whether those are autoimmune conditions, or diabetes, or heart disease, or any other chronic health issues, then head over to jfeldmanwellness.com slash energy, where you can sign up for a free energy balance mini course, where I'll explain how these different symptoms and conditions are really caused by a lack of energy, and I'll also walk you through the main things that you can do from a diet and lifestyle perspective to maximize your cellular energy and resolve these symptoms and conditions. So to sign up for that free energy balance mini course, head over to jfeldmanwellness.com slash energy. And with that, let's get started. All right, so Tara asks, if part of the reason why some gain weight following this plan is because of the need to refill glycogen after following a low-carb diet, how does one know when glycogen has been refilled and working properly again? Also, how much weight can really be attributed to that? So this is a common question or something that's commonly discussed, especially for people who are coming from a low-carb diet or even just a lower-calorie diet or a situation where someone was exercising a lot where there can be significant fluctuations in glycogen storage from when you're coming from a low-carb diet or a low-calorie, high-exercise diet and then adding in a lot of carbs and potentially decreasing exercise. And that can account for some amount of weight gain. And often, part of the reason this is discussed is because when someone is specifically on something like a low-carb diet, and then maybe they binge on some carbs on the weekend or something, they'll notice a big jump up in, in weight. And then, and that's not always because of glycogen, but that can be because of glycogen, and then they they might realize that they... Uh, that when you know a couple days later the, the weight comes back down and so this isn't a change in body fat that tends to be more of a change in glycogen and water content or it can also be a situation that has more to do with gut irritation and bloating and, and water retention due to that but regardless when somebody is adding in carbs from a low carb diet they will refill glycogen stores that have been depleted for people who don't know glycogen is the stored form of carbohydrates that we store in our muscles and we store in our liver those are the two main areas And so when we are on a low carb diet, it does decrease our glycogen stores uh, or yeah, especially if we're exercising as well. And then adding in carbs will increase those glycogen stores. 
And so this can account for a small amount of weight and of weight increase. And we'll talk about the specifics there as far as how much weight this could actually account for. But it's something that's often cited for potentially more weight than it actually accounts for uh, when someone's gain, when someone gains some weight when adding carbs back. So I, I guess it's probably best to to talk about exactly how much weight we can, how much weight gain can be accounted for by an increase in glycogen storage, and then we'll go from there. Yeah, I mean, so the first thing we need to know, well, I guess there's there's a, this is two pieces here. So the first piece here is, is what adds nuance to this idea is, is that as far as glycogen and weight is that glycogen is generally stored with water. So you can mm-hmm. not, the weight gain has not, doesn't only, is not only accounted by the increase in glycogen, but it's also accounted by the increase in water. So you need to know how much water is added and how much glycogen is added. So luckily there's research out there that tells us there's about a one to three ratio. So for every one gram of glycogen, there's three grams that comes along as water. There is some minor variation in this depending on the circumstance. Um, but the most commonly accepted value or ratio is that one to three. So we know that there is about one to three, one gram of glycogen comes with three grams of water. So the next piece that we need to understand is, well, how much glycogen does the, what, how much glycogen can the human body hold per se? Uh, and there's some interesting feet, uh, overfeeding studies on this. Uh, and essentially the number came out to be roughly 700 grams of glycogen, um, is kind of like an upper limit They can get a little bit more than that, but I would say we'll stick with 700 grams because your glycogen content will obviously depend on how much muscle mass you have, how big you are as a person, how large your liver is, all that type of good stuff. So, but just keep nice round, even numbers and based on the study, uh, 700 grams is about what we, what we would see. And that's 700. So we have 700 grams of glycogen. And then since we have three grams of water for every one gram of glycogen, then we would have 2,100 grams of water. Um, all together, that would leave us with 2,800 grams of water and glycogen combined. And this is roughly six pounds of excess weight. Now, with this said, there can be more water that's stored in a different process or in a different way. Maybe the water is associated with some type of glycosoaminoglycan, which is um, uh, a protein and a carbohydrate bound together, like you see in mucus or things like that. But I would say after like six, maybe 10 pounds is an absolute max. It's not like, it's most likely not just like water weight anymore, unless there's some type of inflammatory process or some type of heart failure, or you have like, you're like, ascites or something something's more serious like that if you're like seriously gaining weight on you know if you're like gaining weight precipitously precipitously over the course of multiple months and you've gone up 15 20 25 30 pounds um i would really start to consider that you are most likely actually gaining weight and putting on body fat and not just putting on water the different the other Another stipulation here I want to add is that if you are somebody who's coming from being underweight, if you had gone on keto or in carnivore or because you had an autoimmune disease or you're coming from an autoimmune disease um, and you're severely underweight, your body is going to, first of all, you're probably going to have a period, like a refeeding type effect where you're going to be extremely hungry. And I wouldn't say to suppress that hunger in that refeeding period what I would say is to choose the foods that you refeed with carefully. Um, and we, I think we touched on this in another episode, so maybe we'll link to it uh, as far as like refeeding from those situations. But in those circumstances, the body is, has a lot of things going on. So like in, if with eating disorders or any type of underweight scenario, you basically have to rebuild those tissues. That includes bone, that includes muscle, that includes connective tissue, that includes um, glycogen, the whole host of processes need to go on there. So if you're gaining weight in that perspective, it may not necessarily be all glycogen and, or it may not only be fat. It could be other mm-hmm. tissues as well. So that if, if you're ha- at a normal body weight and you're coming off of a low carb diet and you're, you put on like 
between six to 10 pounds, like kind of quick in the first two weeks or so, uh, especially if you're not like massively overeating, then I would say most likely it, that could be attributed to a large extent to water weight. But if you continue to put on after that, then I would say there's, there's something going on. And the, the solution for that and the adjustments for that is adjusting what types of foods you're eating and as, as well as, um, depending on the situation, quantities of those types of foods. And I say this specifically from a bioenergetic perspective, because I see a lot of people come to the peace sphere and they want to pound tons of milk with sugar in it and ice cream and, um, like gummy bears and all these types of all these, all these types of foods. And a lot of these foods in excess or in large quantities can in fact put weight on you, different people's tolerances to those foods, different quantities of those foods, and then having large amounts of granulated sugar, not having adequate amounts of, uh, different vitamins and minerals, what nutrition in general can lead to states where you, you are putting on tons of weight. And this is especially the case if you're coming out of a state of eating excessively low carbs, or you're coming out of a state of low calorie dieting or one meal a day or intermittent fasting, there has, I, my preference for moving people in the right direction is to have a reverse dieting strategy where you're essentially progressively adjusting cal calories from nutrient dense foods that are easily digested and absorbed consistently over time, instead of just like opening the floodgates and <laughs> you know, it's all free now. Carbs are good. I'm going to eat um, uh, all these different types of carbs, whatever it is. So I, I prefer like a more controlled, consistent approach to allow your body to adapt to the food, make sure you're not irritated by any different foods based on the state that you're coming from. And then to slowly ramp up over time to allow your digestion to catch up and then to allow your metabolism to catch up to this increased food input. Yeah. Yeah. So to, to back up just to the glycogen piece here as you mentioned for somebody who's storing up to 700 grams of carbs which is uh that that study you were referring to is in athletes who were pretty lean that would be on the high end and then someone who's on a low carb diet does not have zero grams of glycogen so at most here you, were, you mentioned that uh 700 grams of glycogen storage would result in about six pounds of weight so if we were to say uh you know maybe more like four or five pounds could be more reasonable as far as actual glycogen gain probably even more like four uh glycogen and water gain and, and so as you mentioned when somebody is first introducing a lot of carbs some amount of that of weight that might be increased will be due to glycogen replenishment but we're not talking about that much there there are other as you mentioned there are other things that any weight gain can be attributed to that are not body fat so you mentioned things like bone and muscle and the, you know regeneration of various tissues and things and and so that's all worth reiterating the other thing is the actual food weight right where for a while if you were eating a low calorie diet uh or if you're eating like a mostly meat diet let's say the actual weight of the food might be much less compared to what you're eating now and maybe it was much less liquid all of those things i mean obviously you know if you were to drink a couple bottles of water and step on the scale you're going to be a couple bottles of water worth of weight heavier so the actual amount of food that you're eating is also going to influence uh, a weight shift if you do start to increase the amount of food, just simply in food weight. So what we're getting at here is that if you're initially gaining five to 10 pounds in a very short amount of time, that can la largely be attributed to things that are not body fat. And in reality, it takes a pretty decent amount of time to actually put on body fat. Uh, you're not putting on a pound plus of body fat a day. So... That's kind of part one, and then you, you kind of jumped on to part two, which is an important part two, which is that if you are gaining more than that initial five to 10 pounds in a short period of time, where you are continually gaining more weight in a lo longer period of time, that's suggestive of something else being off. Uh, for someone who's very underweight, it could be a really good thing in that case, and maybe not something that's off, maybe just healthy weight that needed to be regained. And other than that, it can be a sign that things are off, and maybe you're eating foods that are for whatever issue causing you to to gain body fat in a way that is less than optimally healthy in which case you mentioned a bunch of different strategies or things to consider those are all important and i'll link back to all the weight loss episodes that we've done 
that I would take a look at as well as the a couple of episodes talking about introducing carbs back in from like a from a carnivore diet and uh, those would all be good things to consider if someone's in that situation. Yeah. The other thing I want to add to is that um, all that carbohydrate that you're adding in currently does not just go straight to glycogen as well. As you increase your carbohydrate intake, you well, a couple things happen. First of all, you're going to decrease if you don't have like serious metabolic derangement, you're going to decrease your fat oxidation. You're going to increase your carbohydrate oxidation. The study that I'm pulling this information from literally discusses drastically upregulating carbohydrate oxidation um, from 74 grams per day to 398 grams per day. So just by changing, and this was, this again was an athlete, but just by changing the carbohydrate consumption, um, over, over a period of, you know, a couple of days can drastically adjust the amount of carbohydrates that your body oxidizes. And that means actually uses for energy. The other piece is there is it'll, uh, they, so it's using the carbohydrates for energy, uh, turning them into glycogen. Those carbohydrates have a helpful effect of sparing protein. So in this same study, protein oxidation actually decreased. Um, so, and, and, and once it decreased to a certain amount, it, it didn't completely eliminate it altogether, but it eliminated it large to a very large extent. And then it kind of maintained itself. Um, so there's, there's just like a whole bunch of beneficial effects going on there with the decreasing protein oxidation and going to glycogen producing energy. And then the other thing that carbohydrates do, and this one's kind of interesting is that the amount of glycogen that your body stores is upregulated when you increase your carbohydrate consumption. So your, your body has, it or is responsive to how much carbs you have coming in and it, it's, a, it adaptively adjusts. And this is one of the issues that you get to when you start talking about calories in calories out, because if you just thinking of it as a static equation, you lose the fact that the body adjusts to the different nutrients and how much protein are you taking and how much carbs are you taking and how much fat you're taking? What are their effects on those hormones? What are their effects on disposal? Is it increasing carb oxidation and increasing glycogen storage? And then is it also um, increasing thyroid hormone function? Is it sparing protein so you have more amino acids available for lean tissue development? Is it, um, you know, is the is thyroid is increasing thyroid upregulation, upregulating um, heat production through through brown fat, whatever it is. There's multiple there's multiple adjustments here. So just something it's a little bit tangential, but just something interesting to see. But the effect of increasing carbohydrates has like multiple effects on the utilization of carbohydrates and adjusting their metabolism. So, and another thing to point out here is that if you're coming from that low carb state and you're coming from that, you know, uh, the keto state or the low calorie state, you're going to actually have metabolic adjustments in this period of time as your body is adapts to this new stimulus. So it may take a couple days, not only for your intestinal tract to upregulate it's the different, the different glucose transporters, glute five, glute two, whatever it is, uh, also upregulate, you know, amylase in your, in your saliva, upregulate digestion of the carbohydrates overall, then your liver can increase its liver glycogen, the liver glycogen storage, or your muscles can increase glycogen storage. Your body can start to adjust how it's going to oxidize those carbohydrates, lower the fat oxidation, spare protein. So it's doing a whole host of different things. And that take time to unfold appropriately. And it's, it kind of like it, that's why I like the gradual approach because it allows you to, to make that slow adapt adaptation for a personal anecdote. I remember when we first popped off, uh, our low carb keto intermittent fasting, cyclical, low carb type of stuff. And we would just go like, there's days where we would just have binges because we were so carb hungry. And I remember like, I would be like quite bloated from the amount of carbs I was having during that period of time. And like, at currently that amount of carbs wouldn't bother me at all. But in that period of time where I had been eating keto and low carb and intermittent fasting and having high calorie and low calorie days, and eating excessive amounts of protein and fat compared to carbs, when I was when I went to go take in those carbs, my body wasn't used to it. They hadn't, there had those adaptations to that carbohydrate metabolism hadn't been adjusted. So when I did throw in like what was considered high amount of carbs for me at that point, which maybe was like 200 grams, maybe 
a little more than 200, it was like, whoa, like that's like way too much carbs. Like I'm sleepy. Um, this, I'm, you know, my, my carbohydrate tolerance is terrible. And it's like, now I'll do like 400 grams, 400 what days I've had 500. And I'm like, doesn't phase me. Like I, I just feel normal. So there's, there's definitely those adjustments. There's definitely an adjustment period. It's important to keep in mind. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and that's one of those things that I, you know, we've definitely discussed in those weight loss episodes where, as you mentioned, it takes time for our metabolism to catch up largely due to, I mean, it could be due to various issues. It could be due to excessive stress metabolism for a long period of time, which suppresses thyroid activity, especially if you see that on a low carb diet, uh, you know, and also the reproductive hormones being suppressed. It can also be due to various gut issues that have come about nutrient deficiencies. All of those things can, can be issues as far as our capacity for carb oxidation. So yeah, those are all things to consider. Uh, and I do know, and even in some of the, uh, carb refeeding studies, they were seeing over 400 grams of, of carb oxidation a day, even when having a considerable amount of fat intake too. And I'm pretty sure I've seen studies where on high carb, low fat diets, you're seeing above that as well. So, uh, it can definitely get pretty high up there, uh, depending on what our needs are. I mean, which obviously makes sense in, uh, in terms of our bodies being able to adjust to the substrate that they're taking in. So, yep. And I want to point out too, that in these studies, there is the novel lipogenesis. So the liver will make some fat from those carbohydrates. And I know like everybody that I, or not everybody, but a lot of people that I talk to assume that that is a bad thing. Like that's, it's so terrible to make fat from carbohydrate. It's like, there's an assumption already there. And it's like, at least from my perspective, I think that's physiologic. That's normal. I think, you know, if you're going to go on a really low fat diet, your body does require fats for a host of different functions. So if you have an excess of carbohydrate, it's going to try and adjust and create, at least from my perspective, it's an intelligent mechanism. It's going to adjust and the excess carbohydrate, it's going to move towards fat, whether that fat's going to be stored for another point in time or that fat is going to be stored or the fat's going to be used for some other process, um, whatever it is, you know, powering your muscles at rest, whatever, whatever that actual function is. And so, yeah, so I, I just want to point out that I don't think the the physiologic de novo lipogenesis is a problem. I think a patho pathologic de novo lipogenesis may, maybe it's not a problem, but it, it's definitely part of a pathology and it's indicating that there is a problem. So I think that it's important to delineate between having a regular de novo lipogenesis because you're eating a lot of carbs in general and you're, you know, you're, you're having, an, you're overfeeding, you're basically eating over your maintenance calories and it's not on based on calories and calories out and like a static formula. But if you want to talk about it, calories and calories out in terms of like an adaptive uh, fluid formula, that's adjusting with all the multitude of factors then yeah, if you're overfeeding, you will probably have some de novo lipogenesis and you probably will have some storage of fat on the body. I don't think this is what's causing obesity. And I think there's a whole different story behind that, a whole bunch of different physiologic mechanisms. And that's where you draw the line. It's like, okay, that's pathology. And this is, this is physiology and the physio the normal physiology is fine. The pathology is okay. There's something going on here. That's forcing the body or the bot not forcing the body, but the body is deciding to create an excessive amount of fat because of X, Y, Z condition that it's currently dealing with. Yeah. I mean, in normal quote unquote, normal amounts, you're not seeing very much de novo lipogenesis from carbohydrates in these overfeeding studies where you're seeing maybe 1500 calories of in, you know, excess, excess. beyond what they were eating before. And you know, eating 800 plus grams of carbs a day, then you can see considerable amounts of conversion from carbohydrate to fat, which as you said, is normal in the same way that if you had huge amounts of fat, you would store it as fat. And that can still be responsible for weight gain if somebody's doing that. Uh, and as you said, that's part of why you want to do these things gradually as opposed to just adding in an extra 1500 calories per day uh, all of a sudden. So yeah. And and we, you know, we, outside of that, I mean, it's just a matter of, of, you know, there will be excess de novo lipogenesis if you're not using carbohydrates well for various of, you know, various reasons that uh, would inhibit carb oxidation as we've discussed. So 
as long as those things are addressed, it shouldn't really be a concern is basically what you're saying, which I, I agree with. Yeah. All right. So blonde Billy blonde <laughs> asks, <laughs> could you talk about calcium in a future episode? It would be nice to know what are the options for people that are extremely allergic to dairy? I've tried all types of dairy for years now, including raw goat milk, kefir, yogurt, etc. It keeps giving me issues. Actual powder gave me dig digestive upset. Is calcium supplementation a big no-no? This is a good question. I think we've gotten a few different uh, questions like this on, on some of the YouTube videos. And what I will say is that ideally we want to be getting calcium from our diet if we can. And we've talked about this in the past and I'll link to episodes talking about milk and dairy as a whole. Where there can be a lot of reasons why someone is not doing well with dairy. There's digestive reasons where a lot of people don't digest the lactose very well because they don't have enough lactase. And that can be uh, tied to low thyroid function. It can be tied to SIBO, which is also tied to low thyroid function. So you can have gut issues that basically prevent you from being able to actually break down the lactose in the dairy well. And that will go on to feed bacteria and increase endotoxin and cause discomfort and all sorts of reactions. So in that case, you want to take out dairy and then work on addressing the gut issues and thyroid issues. And then you might be able to introduce dairy back in and be totally fine. Now, there are also cases where somebody might have issues with other aspects of the dairy. Maybe it has to do more with the proteins, like a reactivity to the whey or casein, which again, that could be something that can improve over time as well, as far as our general reactivity toward things, how allergenic foods are uh, that can improve over time. Our, our general reactivity to those things can improve over time. But there are certainly instances where even in those we're even after addressing a lot of the general metabolic things, someone still doesn't do well with dairy. And in that case, it can be tough to get enough calcium. And again, what I would say here is to look back at those other episodes that I'll link to talking about dairy, because there's a progression of things that I would try if someone is not doing well with dairy, starting with trying different types, uh, maybe focusing more on, on cheeses that are much lower in the lactose and on from there. Uh, but, in the context that somebody is not doing well with dairy, regardless of those other issues, we do have needs for calcium. And so we still want to make sure that we're getting enough. And at that point, the question is, what do we do to get calcium? And so a lot of times, one of the suggestions is eggshell calcium, which some people do totally fine with. And it's basically a calcium carbonate from eggshells that you heat up and then you grind it up into a powder. And, you know, I would say generally that's fine if, if you're able to have that without any digestive upset or any other symptoms that would be a good version for for a calcium supplement as well as other forms of calcium carbonate which again if you have them without any digestive irritation or anything like that it would be fine i would recommend if you are going to have those to have them away from food because the carbonate part of the calcium carbonate will buffer stomach acid it'll decrease stomach acid so we don't want to be having for example a protein heavy meal when we're taking that, it's almost like if we were to take baking soda, uh, it can uh, buffer that stomach acid and makes it harder to digest protein. So if you are supplementing with a calcium uh, carbonate type supplement, then you want to make sure you're taking that away from food. But those would all be things that can work. And I'll say also that Mike is, I, I know that you don't do particularly well with dairy. And so a lot of this applies to your situation. And so you've tried some different calcium supplements. So I'll let you dig into some details there as far as what you found works and or has worked for you and, and why that might be. Yeah. So as far as the dairy situation goes, uh, I think the, the best option for somebody who's having an aller an allergic allergic reaction to dairy, the, and the biggest problem I see with dairy isn't as much the lactose. I think the, a lot of people can actually become okay with lactose over time because the microbiome will adjust and then the mm -hmm. body, I think adjusts a bit the, depending on, you know, depending on the individual's genetics towards lactase persistence or anything like that. And then if lactose is a the problem, then you still have yogurt, you still have cheese. I mean, Pecorino Romano is absolutely delicious. I'm just going to put that out there, but <laughs> <laughs> I would literally put, if I could eat dairy, I would throw that on any of my any, all of my food, every single meal, that, and maybe ketchup. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, as far as, as far as refined taste, yes, very <laughs> Sorry, the, the taste of a toddler, <laughs> <laughs> the taste of a four-year-old, but, um, 
I think that the biggest issues I see with people with dairy is the reaction to the casein and not tolerating casein well. So there's two types of reactions to the casein. There's one, which is with the A1 casein, where the casein is actually degraded into, uh, I think it's beta casomorphin 7. And that is that has a very potent opiate effect, meaning it uh, signals the same type of effect that morphine or Percocet or Dilaudid or heroin all signal. It's not the strength and potency and the direct interactions with the different opiate receptors, whether it's like mu, kappa, whatever the other ones, whatever they are. Um, I don't remember them off the top of my head for this, but as essentially whatever the interaction is with those receptors might be a little bit different. So it may have a little bit different of a profile and that opiate effect can cause symptoms like constipation, lowered motivation. Um, if it's really potent for some people or they're in a, like quite a bad state, it can lower dopamine pretty significantly and allow prolactin to rise. And then I guess it's plausible that it may induce some type of gyno and very susceptible people. Um, overall, I think a lot of that also depends on the state, but so you have that first situation where it's like, you don't tolerate the A1 casein very well. Okay. So the solution to that is A2 casein. And what that means is moving away from cow milk in most situations and moving towards either A2 casein or moving towards A2 cows. Yeah, A2. Well, a, yeah, casein from A2 cows. Right. right. At, or having like goat products. And because then the reason I say goat, like there's camel, there's buffalo, there's all these different things, but goat is probably like the most easily available in the supermarkets now compared to, I mean, if you can find camel milk, please send, like, you know, if you find camel milk in Whole Foods, send me a picture. <laughs> but <laughs> the, um, I, that would be the easiest option if that is the actual problem. And then the other thing you can do is if that is a significant problem, moving towards more heavily fermented cheeses with might be able to mitigate that because the bacteria can pre-digest some of the casein protein and perhaps eliminate some of those peptides. So that is, that is an option. Now, if you are actually allergic to casein, like you have either a like an IgE mediated allergy, which is like a, like a potent allergy, or you have a type four, like hypersensitivity reaction where it's like a, it's kind of a delayed reaction to it. And it just, you, the reaction is kind of weird. It can give you weird symptoms. Then I would say, uh, you could try a cheese that degrades the protein, like pre hydrolyzes it because of the bacterial enzymes and the degradation products. And then if that doesn't work, then I would, then, it, then it would be to, basically eliminate dairy. So for me, I have eliminated dairy because I've tested positive for allergies to it and I get an allergic response. It's quite funny because I'm actually lactase persistent. So you would think if I'm lactase persistent genetically, like that I can digest lactose, no problem, that I should technically be able to eat dairy, but you know, such is life, right? <laughs> so essentially in that case, then the next step I would, I would move towards would be using something like um like the like any calcium carbonate source the reason i think both you and i agree with the calcium carbonate source is because the some of the other calciums like calcium citrate or calcium citrate malate we've we've talked in the past that citric acid is definitely problematic but some the calcium bonded to some of these organic acids can be quite irritating to the intestine or the citric acid can be contaminated so i've never reacted well to those to those specific types of calcium, but I have reacted well to um, one specific type of calcium and that's coral calcium. So the calcium sources, the calcium carbonate sources that I prefer to look towards are uh, animal product based calciums. So that could be like an oyster shell calcium, a scallop shell calcium, um, a uh, the coral calcium or the eggshell calcium. Now for the eggshell calcium specifically, I think a lot of people have problems with it because it doesn't get ground up very fine because this is what happens when I did it. I didn't grind it up very fine. And then it was like eating sand. <laughs> so that was definitely, that definitely didn't work. It irritated my intestinal tract pretty severely, especially because mine is um, quite easily irritated still uh, just based on the story, my past story and everything, you know, all, all that type of stuff. But so the, the coral calcium, I actually, I tried calcium carbonate after that because, I, you know, it was more finely ground. I thought I have a reaction and it just bloated me and made me feel uncomfortable. But then I tried coral calcium, which is a calcium of fossilized coral. 
basically above ground fossilized coral. And that coral calcium has the calcium in a different, in like a matrix, uh, essentially. So it's like a matrix of the different proteins and other minerals and the calcium all together. And I think for some reason, and then also the, the coral actually has different types of proteins and compounds in them that they're actually talking about extracting from the coral at this point. I think there's like some research talking about extracting heparin from some types of coral, which is interesting. So I, overall, I think that having the protein in that matrix made it much more easily, easy for me to digest and assimilate because I've responded great to the coral calcium. I haven't had digestive issues, had constipation. I haven't had any type of bloating, not, nothing like that. And um, so, yeah, so that, that was, that was kind of the best option. The reason I didn't go for oyster shell or some of the other ones is because they can be contaminated with heavy metal. Sometimes depends on where the, we are getting the oyster shell calcium from. So I would say the best bets, the best calcium as far as supplement goes would be either eggshell or coral calcium. And if you tolerate calcium carbonate, then, you know, that that's good, but it does have a high kind of GI side effect for a lot of people. So the next pieces of the, the next sources of calcium after dairy, eggshell and coral calcium or a calcium carbonate would be something like a brassica vegetable. So that could be, and it, the, the there's a couple problems with this, but the brassica vegetables, if you cook them down pretty well and you make them digestible, like if you boil broccoli or kale or something like that, that can give you an appreciable amount of calcium. The only problem with that is that, for example, if you wanted to get all of your, if you wanted to get one gram of calcium a day, you'd have to eat one and a half pounds of cooked kale. So, and kale comes with a whole host of goitrogenic compounds, especially if eaten on a consistent basis in large quantities. So it's, I wouldn't say it's an ideal option. That's why I would lean towards the other varieties. And then some of the other options you have available are if you were to eat like fish that had the bones still in, and they were soft enough to eat. So like sardines sometimes, but again, it's hard to make that the main source of, of your calcium because it can come with large amounts of omega-3 fatty acids. And despite what you think about omega-3 fatty acids, large amounts of them in most situations have not proven to be helpful, even if you think that they're, they're absolutely necessary. So it's kind of like calcium is kind of one of those hard ones. Um, and I would say that the best bet or the best, my best experience has been with coral calcium. And then the last thing I want to add, which is, I think um, it's not contradictory to what you're saying, but if anybody's looked at some of the things I've talked about in terms of setting up a meal where you leave a 15 minute gap between when you have your fruit and your juice versus when you have your, your protein and whatnot, I actually like to put the coral calcium in, in my juice. It, so I'll make a smoothie. It'll be like a frozen fruit and some, or, and some fresh fruit and some juice all together. And then the calcium carbonate from the coral calcium reacts with the actual juices because you have a very acidic environment with a very basic substance and it gives it like a, like a nice carbonation. And I haven't found that to impair my digestion very much. And I think perhaps the reaction might help with that. So I generally, with people I rec I work with, I recommend to put in, you know, calcium and magnesium in their juice if they're going to, and then wait the 15 minutes and then have their meat and their vegetables and whatnot. The other thing I want to talk about here is I'm pretty sure there's a study showing that when you take in the calcium carbonate and you um, like, there's a lag time where the stomach actually adjusts to the calcium and it produces more acid. So it may be helpful to have the calcium that 15, 20 minutes before. And I'm theorizing because I found that I've been fine doing that. And it just, I, there's a study showing that. And then basically the reaction, like basically creating the carbon dioxide from the calcium carbonate interacting with the acids and the juice. It's all theory, but it, I kind of just theorized after I was like, oh, wow, I'm doing fine with coral calcium if I put in my juice 15 minutes before a meal. So, Gotcha. So as long as in this case, it seems like, in, or at least in your case, as long as it's separated by at least 15, 20 minutes, it's fine. As, well, I should say 15, yeah. 20 minutes prior to having the, the protein. Yeah, exactly. If you do it at, if you do it after, then you not, if you eat your protein, and then you have your calcium and your juice. Not only are you buffering your stomach acid with the calcium, you're diluting it with the juice. And it's just, if you want yeah. to have a meal sit in your stomach and feel really full for a period of time, at least in my experience, that's a great way to do it. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Cool. I don't have anything else to add for that one. Um, 
yeah, I, well, as far as the leafy greens go and like the brassica of vegetables, I know you're saying it's probably not going to be too effective as far as a primary or sole source of calcium, which yeah, I agree with. Of course, it can be helpful from, you know, as a supplemental source for calcium. Yeah. The greens, just to point out with the brassica too, they, their absorption is actually quite good uh, for calcium. The problem is, and this is where the, the kicker comes in, is that you have to, the, the way to basically eliminate the vast majority of the goitrogenic compounds is to boil them. And boiling these foods generally leaches a portion of the minerals. So it's kind of like you're kind of at, like, it's kind of a loss either way. Um, and as far, and as far as other vegetables, any of the vegetables that are super high in oxalic acid and supposedly high in, in calcium, like spinach, they are not good sources of calcium. They do not absorb well. They do not get incorporated well. And the oxalic acid can actually cause uh, issues for sensitive people. So I actually recommend in most cages to stay away from, from those foods, uh, those types of leafy greens, if you're trying to eat them for calcium or magnesium or zinc, because a lot of the minerals in there just get bound up and you, they're relatively minimal compared to what you would get from other sources. Which would fall, which leafy greens would fall into each category? So in the brassica family, you have broccoli, kale, Brussels sprouts, collard greens, uh, bok choy, I think kohlrabi, and yeah, spinach. I forget the name, the, the actual like classification for spinach, but it's in a separate family. And so there's spinach and um, I think Swiss chard are actually in like in that other family and they're super high in oxalates. So the oxalate that's uh, that oxalic acid will bind up not only the calcium but also the magnesium manganese zinc and it's just it's kind of a loss with those i mean they may have some beneficial effects in the microbiome like but i wouldn't say that they're like a super nutrient dense uh option overall and, and there's been quite a few studies basically showing that the oxalic acid isn't good for uh, for maintaining um like absorbing and using the calcium yeah, 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 absolutely. And again, that doesn't mean that like there isn't some benefits to spinach if for certain people that tolerate it. I just think that it's not a great source of nutrients how people like to promote it as because because of the digestive, I guess it's a, more of a binder than a digestive inhibitor. Plus, I've had a lot of people have kind of bad reactions to the oxalic acid. So mm -hmm. some of the high oxalic acid foods like will give them joint discomfort and things like that. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen that. I've seen that as well. All right. We're going to wrap up this episode there. If you did enjoy it, please leave a like or comment if you're watching on YouTube. And if you're listening elsewhere, please leave a review or five-star rating on iTunes. All of those things really do a lot to help support the podcast and are very much appreciated. And today's episode was a Q&A episode. If you have any questions that you'd like us to answer on a future Q&A episode, you can send those in to j at jfeldmanwellness.com. That's J-A-Y at J-A-Y Feldman Wellness .com, or feel free to leave those in the comments if you're watching on YouTube. To check out the show notes for today's episode, you can head over to jfeldmanwellness.com slash podcast, where you can take a look at the studies and articles and anything else that we referenced throughout today's episode. And if you are struggling with any low energy symptoms, maybe those are related to the symptoms that we discussed today as far as weight gain when adding in carbohydrates to your diet or maybe you're having trouble digesting dairy, you're having trouble getting some calcium uh, sources into your diet, or maybe you're dealing with any other low energy symptoms like fatigue or joint pain or brain fog or insomnia or hormonal imbalances, or if you're dealing with any other low energy symptoms or any chronic health issues or conditions, whether those are autoimmune conditions or diabetes or heart disease or any other chronic health issues, then head over to jfeldmanwellness.com energy where you can sign up for a free energy balance mini course where I'll explain how these symptoms and conditions are really caused by a lack of energy. And I'll also walk you through the main things that you can do from a diet and lifestyle perspective to maximize your cellular energy and resolve these symptoms and conditions. So to sign up for that free energy balance mini course, head over to jfeldmanwellness.com energy. And with that, I'll see you in the next episode.